When we first started designing the greenhouse for Morningside, we realized that we had a major water issue. In fact, the dreams and aspirations of having food security on this property all hinged on a well that was producing barely any water. We needed to solve this issue in a way that didn't use additional energy and encouraged flora and fauna to regenerate the land. What we've come up with is an elegant solution of swales, check dams and ponds that will allow this 160 acre property to thrive. It will support all of the farming and livestock that we'll be implementing here. And in the next three years, we'll transform this stretch of land into a thriving property. Today, I want to explain how these different water systems work, the importance of managing how water enters and leaves a property, and how these systems interact with the flora and fauna so that you can improve the passive water systems on your own property. Let's start with swales. For those of you who don't know, this is a swale that I'm standing in right now. And we use it to allow water to penetrate and infiltrate the ground effectively so that water is stored during the spring so that it can be used in the summer. A swale is a gentle mound on the downside that's created by moving soil from the back cut into this mound here. And what this does is double or even quadruple the amount of soil that we can use to grow trees and other shrubs and plants that we want on the property. Normally when ice melts or when it rains, the water would flow over land and we would not get the benefit of that water penetrating into the ground. With these swales installed, melt water and the rainwater will flow into these swales and spread out across the landscape, infiltrating down into the ground. As the water sits in the swale, it will infiltrate the soil and flow subsurface all the way down to the bottom of the property, all without eroding the soil. We've got almost four kilometers of swales here at Morningside which allows us to capture and store hundreds of thousands of liters of water per year. All that water would have previously been lost and would have led to erosion on the property and eventually desertification. Using an excavator, it took us close to 90 days to install these swales. In a video, it can be really tough to see what a swale actually looks like. And so this would have been the natural ground before we started. But you can see right here, we've got our first cut and as we cut down on a three to one slope and pull this material into this level bottom right here, it gets mounded up on the top right here, which is what we call the top of the swale mount. And this is where our trees are gonna be planted. So we typically have a tree on the crown and then potentially trees even down below here. All the water that infiltrates down here goes underneath this mound. And in fact, when we first started doing this, we, did, we dug a swale three years ago almost now, and then we came back a year later and the swale was absolutely saturated with water. So we know that they work to store water and infiltrate snow melt. Now it's really important when you put a swale on a property that you have catchment, meaning that water is actually coming onto the property that you want to put to productive use by harvesting it with something like a swale. Now we're really lucky at Morningside to have access to this culvert here, which delivers snow melt. So after the winter, when we come into our melt season, the snow melts all around this property and it's concentrated in this culvert. The melt in the spring happens over a two week period of time and it can send an enormous amount of water through this culvert. Now the culvert delivers this water into an ephemeral drainage and it concentrates the water, which is why we see such high erosive rates when you don't control it on a property like this. And so one of the ways that we manage the water is we slow it down with these check dams. And check dams are basically one rock structures, one rock high, that creates speed bumps in the drainage itself that reduces the amount of sediment in the water and de-energizes it to reduce the erosion. This is a check dam. They're also sometimes referred to as one rock dams or ORDs, O-R-Ds. Check dams are basically rocks that are placed in a masonry style, so we interlock them in a way that creates a speed bump in this ephemeral drainage so that when water is flowing over here, it's basically a leaky dam. And so water will build up behind here and as it's sitting behind here, it infiltrates laterally into the sides, which will help the grass grow. And eventually over time, we'll end up with shrubs and trees that grow over top of it, which reduce the evaporation and increase the soil moisture. Now, after a couple of years of having this one rock dam here, we already have a really elevated level of soil moisture right here. And when we compare it to some soil 
just outside of this little region right here, we can see that the quality is quite different. We've got super dusty soil here and, and pretty moist fertile soil right here. So this is from behind the One Rock Dam and this is adjacent to the One Rock Dam. Now a couple of other really interesting features of a One Rock Dam, we've got the actual dam itself and then we also have the splash skirt on the bottom side here. So as water comes over top of this rock, it's splashing onto these rocks down here which are also interlocked which reduces any erosive force of the water falling down onto the soil. It's then able to continue down the ephemeral drainage until it hits the next one rock down. And so they're basically control structures that are placed at strategic locations in the ephemeral drainage to create that slowing action so that we don't end up with water in rapidly increasing in velocity and volume, which dramatically increases the erosive force of the water moving down the drainage. If you want to see how effective these simple structures can be in the right settings, check out Neil Spackman's project in Saudi Arabia called the Al Baida Project, where he used check dams all the way from the top of mountains close to the property down into the property itself to completely terraform a highly degraded, desertified project in one of the hottest places on earth. After the water goes through the series of check dams, it gets picked up in a swale which then delivers the water laterally across the landscape, spreading the water out so that it can infiltrate over a very large area. We live in a really cold climate and it gets pretty cold here in the winter time. And as a result of that, the ground freezes. Now up to half of the water that this ecosystem receives on an annual basis comes in the form of snow. Now snow is frozen water. And when the snow is sitting on the ground in the winter time, it just sits there, it doesn't infiltrate. But when the spring comes along and the snow starts to melt because it's acting as an insulator, the ground below it is unable to infiltrate that water because it's frozen up to three feet down. As a result of that, as the snow melt washes across the landscape, it's not able to get into the ground. And so swales and check dams allow us to slow this melt water down perch it into the landscape on these level ditches which thaw the ground and infiltrate it deep into the soil structure. This ostensibly doubles the amount of water that we can utilize on this property. So the swales allow us to capture the snow melt that normally would have been run off. The trees that we're going to plant on this property and additional snow fences allow us to bring even more snow onto the property which can mean that we can actually quadruple the amount of water on this property. So in addition to being deliberate about how water comes into the swales, we also have to be deliberate about how it leaves the swales. Because water has the ability to both create life, but also take it away. When it's pacified, it creates it. And when it's not pacified, when it's got lots of energy, it can actually be very destructive. We need to manage the way that water leaves the swales. And so we have two methods to do this. The first method is the spillway, which is what I'm sitting in front of right now. And the second method, which I'll show you shortly, is the monk pipe. We call this a level sill spillway because at the top of this change in vegetation between here and down here, the edge where you see all the grass is dead level. So in the same way that when you go to the mall and you see a fountain with water going gently over the edge of the fountain, creating a really thin sheet of water, we want to mimic that pattern here so that we don't end up having the erosive energy of water coming through a culvert, but instead a passive sheet of water going over a really long surface. That's going to have almost no erosive capacity. So the first thing that happens when the water enters a swale is the water slowly increases in elevation until it reaches the height of this spillway, at which point the water will flow over top of the spillway gently and move on to the next swale in the landscape. There's three main elevations that you need to understand in order to be able to build a swale. Number one is the top of the mound where I'm standing right now, and this is where the trees are gonna be planted. We don't want the water coming over the top of the mound. Number two is the spillway height. So this is below the top of the mound, but above the bottom of the swale. And in fact, the spillway is typically 12 inches or 30 centimeters higher than the bottom of the swale. The last is the bottom of the swale, and this is the piece that is level all the way across the landscape. And so in the same way, when you fill a bathtub up, the water doesn't concentrate in the front and then flow into the back. A bathtub fills up simultaneously 
The swale is also going to fill up with water simultaneously until it reaches the spillway height, at which point it's gonna flow over top. This is a monk pipe, and it's ostensibly a pipe that just gets placed through the swale. So there's an outlet on the other side of the swale. And this elbow is what determines what height the water in the swale gets to. And we set this elevation such that it was the same elevation as the spillway that we just went and saw. However, if we want to shunt water to a lower swale and avoid the use of the spillway, we can remove this elbow and then position it at a lower elevation just by rotating it down. So if we wanted more water in a lower swale, the water would start flowing through this monk pipe much sooner than it would start flowing out of the spillway. So this gives us a lot of flexibility to be able to manipulate how the water traverses the landscape during a melting season. In addition to swales infiltrating water for later use in the season and rehydration of a landscape, we can also use them for catchment to fill ponds like this one. This is our primary water storage pond at Morningside and it provides us with irrigation for the greenhouse and gardens. It will also provide us with water for livestock and fire suppression during our fire season here in central BC. Now the pond is not currently full because we haven't had a fantastic melt event yet, but over the next couple of years, we'll get one of those melt events and this pond will fill up and then back flood into the swales and create an enormous amount of water storage which we can use for multiple years into the future. So at this stage, we haven't planted trees on the swales, but that will happen in a future project. Once we have those trees established, they're going to slow the wind moving across the landscape. They're gonna reduce the evaporation. They're gonna increase the amount of shade and ultimately reduce the water coming off of the soil. In essence, drought proofing the landscape. These trees will provide an alternative forage source for our cattle, sheep, and other livestock that we run on the property. They're going to help to increase the snow trapping, which will improve water retention out of the winter and into the spring. And ultimately, we're gonna be able to see the difference that these swales make from space because this particular parcel of land is literally gonna pop off of the map when we look at it through the lens of a satellite. Personally, I think that check dams, swales, and ponds are an amazing set of low-tech strategies to regenerate a piece of land. More often than not, when we're working for people and even on our own properties, we find that water is the weak link. And these are three strategies out of a plethora of options that we use to help us to regenerate the water cycle on properties. Today, we looked at some pretty big examples of swales. However, you can use these concepts on very small sites as well. For example, over the last 10 years, I've been working on urban properties as well, where we've used small versions of these in food forests and gardens. If you're working on a property, large or small, one of the first questions that you have to ask is whether water is your weak link. If it is, I'd encourage you to look up a variety of different landscape water harvesting options and solutions to determine which of these particular treatments might be appropriate for both the scale and type of property that you've got. When we're working with these regenerative systems, we have a couple of mantras that we use. One is water, access, and structures. So fix the water cycle first, then figure out how you're gonna access the property, and then place the structures on there last. We also have another mantra that we think about as blue, green, brown. Fix the water cycle, then the plant cycle comes back, and then we can fix the carbon cycle in the soil, which is ultimately the best way to store water. A 1% increase in soil carbon will increase the water holding capacity of a hectare of land by 168,000 liters, which is absolutely mind bending. So if you found this interesting, this project is going to be going on for a number of years. We're not done it yet. And so we're gonna be doing video updates on a regular basis when we plant the trees, when we put up snow fences, and when we start running our own cattle on this particular property. So if you found this video interesting and you wanna follow along, make sure you subscribe to the channel and head over to the Fifth World website. I'll leave a link in the show notes down below and you can sign up for our newsletter as well. Thanks for watching. We'll see you here again soon.